Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Sundays with David LaFell, the painting doctor. So David is on vacation, so we have a very unusual program for you. Uh, we uh, picked a past program where David did a painting demonstration, did a portrait of Joanne Manji and uh, our friend Joanne Manji. So she was here visiting and we uh, uh, we got her to pose for David. So I think that you, this will be quite an amazing thing. Now, Jackie and I, Jackie is gonna be getting the questions. If you guys happen to have any questions, um, I will try to answer them for you and um, we will probably pause the video. So it's very possible that uh, we won't get through the entire video today, uh, more than likely not. And uh, we'll continue next week and then we'll start up a, another demo as well or another a past program as well that we haven't quite picked yet. But anyway, so uh, really welcome to the program. I'm glad you guys are all here. Um, uh, I'm not sure, I don't think I'm going to be able to say hello to everybody, but know that uh, that we will see it later and uh, and that David will see it later. So he'll see any comments that you guys make. And uh, also just to remind you, we've uh, wrapped up our uh, all, it, I think we're pretty much ready for our figure uh, workshop that is coming up in June. And so it's going to be June 24th through the 27th. And we have kind of an unusual format planned for you. So we, um, on the first day, the 24th, it's going to be really all day. And the morning is going to be open to anybody that wants to join in. And I, I think you're going to really love the morning session. And it's going to set up the whole uh, uh, workshop. So I, anyway, I, I think you guys will really love it. And, uh, and then for those that actually sign up for the workshop, then we'll start that afternoon and then the following three mornings. And so it's, it's an unusual format, but we, we think it's going to be really fun for everybody. So we, we have some uh, great demonstrations, uh, done for you guys, and we're really excited to be able to talk about them. So I think I think we can start. Morning and welcome to Sundays with David LaFell. We have a very special guest here today, Joanne Manji, and she is going to introduce David. So I'm going back behind the camera. <laughs> I, I have the distinct privilege today of introducing Dr. David LaFell, and I'm so thrilled. Uh, I was a little hesitant when he said he wanted to paint me because I thought it was a cruel joke. But um, <laughs> but I'm really excited about this. So I know you're all waiting for him to get started. So take the floor, David. Okay. Well, due to thousands and millions of requests mm -hmm. from you people out there who wanted to see how I start a portrait, uh, I am going to do just that thing today. And show you how I start and what I'm thinking when I do start a portrait. And again, if you have any questions along the way, Sherry will be getting the questions and forwarding them to me. So that's that. Great. Everybody's tuning in. <laughs> All my fans. <laughs> All the fans. Okay. Ready, Joy? I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready whenever you are. I'm ready. Okay. Okay. So we've got Indiana, we have the Netherlands, Nebraska, uh, Canada. New Mexico, California. So the most important thing to me in starting essentially is size and placement over and above just, just drawing. So to me, the most efficient way to start is to get a sense of the entire mass of filled space versus unfilled space. 
and rather than making a drawing and changing the drawing, it's just getting the whole mass of the head and placing it and sizing it to where I feel it would make a beautiful portrait or a beautiful, beautiful painting. Whereas if you start with a careful drawing and then decide it's too big or too small and you have to change it or move it, you've expended a great deal of energy. You've expended a great deal of energy and it's hard to a great deal of really intense energy drawing everything and then you would decide to move it so it's hard to reclaim that intensity and this way you start out painting thinking painting and shapes and masses rather than linearly. You know, so I'm, you get the shape, what I feel is the shape of the face. And just to say that we also have people tuning in from Alaska, Colorado, several from New York City, from India, from Alabama, Florida, Hawaii, Southern California, Belgium, Utah, and Maryland so far. And now Ireland and Kansas City and New Orleans. Inside is grand. So it's important at this stage also to see shapes such as the hair, the, 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 the face, size. And the gesture. So you're starting out with something that looks like a painting, a potential painting right, right from the beginning. You have a whole head and all you have to do is put in the features. And getting a feel of the surface you're working on. And again, if you want to change something or move something, it's much easier than if you had a completed drawing and you had to redraw everything. 
I know there, I have had students in the past who feel more comfortable making a drawing, but, and, you know, it's fine with me, but this way, I feel if you can make a drawing at 10 o'clock, let's say, you can make the same drawing at 11 o'clock. So to depend on something you know how to do just because you feel that the drawing itself gives you an anchor. As I said, there's no reason if you can draw it at 10 o'clock and you're left with this, why you can't draw it at 11 or 12, etc. You're using the same, the same sight, the same eyesight you have, the same talent. So this way, you to start out differently, you're challenging, you're challenging yourself, uh, and that has to be, that has to be a good, a good thing. You can't get better unless you try something you don't feel you know how to do and learn how to do it. So the moment, so that's something, it's more of a psychological problem rather than a drawing problem or a seeing problem. So, uh, so what I like to set first is uh, is the nose as the most central feature in the face and work up or down from that rather than starting with the eyes, which I think is the general tendency. And then like you get a gesture of the head and let's say, we could put the nose someplace here with the shadow and underplane. So let's say we put the nose here, and that kind of gives you a sense of the whole muzzle, and if that that looks comfortable to you and then work up to where approximately where the eye socket. Do you always do that? Start with the nose? Do you always start with the nose? Yeah. You do. Yeah. It's the most central feature, as I just said. And instead of working down, you just, it's much easier, I feel, to estimate. That's interesting because the nose is tough to place. I mean, after we do the eyes. Yeah. So that's so that would be a better way yeah. to start. Yeah. It's I feel it's easier to kind of look from the nose, see how mm -hmm. wide the skin flap is, mm -hmm. the cheekbone, etc. You know, to look to try to estimate that distance, proportion seems to be easier than to see this whole shape of the, the shadow and how it delineates. So you can mm -hmm. move up and down much easier, you know, with the hair relating to that shape and then. Does it matter which eye you go to after the nose? No, it depends on how you're lit up, how the okay. person is lit more than okay. which eye. But these are all subject to change, you know. When you make a drawing of any kind, it looks one way, and then as you give it dimension, mm -hmm. the proportion changes. You know, it looks so large or small just as a flat area but as something that looks three-dimensional 
it changes the whole look of the proportionately, so to speak. Yeah, so. So I'm, what I'm looking at is this eye socket here versus how far the nostril is, you know, like the smile, cheek flap here. This is my Mona Lisa look. You what? My Mona Lisa look. Your Mona Lisa look, yes, definitely. <laughs> so you're looking looking at shapes, you know, uh, the cheek, cheekbone, you know, as I said, it's much easier, I think, than making a careful drawing and having to change it, because you're, you're thinking shape and value masses rather than linear drawing. So the brow ridge, you know. And tell me when you want to take a break. I'm good. Okay. Well, I mean. Yeah, yeah, no, I will. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to be the best model ever. Supermodel. <laughs> yeah, got a little too much. Bail can be a killer sometimes. Which fail mm. John, can you pause the video? Mm -hmm. uh, once David gets back to the, yeah, or once I get back to his, uh, no. his paint, yeah. Okay, yeah, you could po pause it just for a minute. So uh, there was a question about uh, what he's toning the surface with. Uh, as well as the color he's using to mass it in. And I also want to say that since this was one of our really early demonstrations, you know, we were using the old equipment. So obviously you can tell that it's not, it's not the crisp equipment that we have now. But, um, but you, in a way you can see the masses and the simplicity of it, I think even, uh, even better. And also, if uh, there's a question about whether or not he uses Gamsol, and no, we don't use any kind of um, solvent like that. Um, uh, so, so first of all, D David toned the board probably with um, Naples yellow, um, green umber uh, from Old Holland, and maybe a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, burn umber. Uh, anyway, just something neutral is the main thing, and and the the same idea for when he's doing the lay-in right now. So it's it's probably burn umber and ultramarine blue, is my guess. Okay, you can resume. And we have more people tuning in: Ireland, Texas, Italy. New Jersey, London, LA, New York City, <laughs> a lot of people tuning in. People all over. People all over. Cut. Oh. <laughs> you want me to go to, <laughs> go to Joanne? Um, <laughs> what, Sharon? What did she Take say? it away, Joanne. Yeah. <laughs> Artistic license. Don't, don't panic. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. If you're not panicked, I'm not panicked. No. It's if you're worried, then then I will be worried. 
Yeah. It's like with my husband. I never worry until he starts to worry, and then I think I have a problem. <laughs> Don't worry. I had the best seat in the house because I get to see the palette and the and the portrait. Yes. You're lucky. Yeah, I am. I'm a lucky person. Yeah. Stick with me. So when you say simplify the darks, you don't necessarily mean that the color won't change in the darks. Right? No, you, you just, you have to paint the darks as if you were looking at the light. The problem gets to be, as a painter, you stare at what you're looking at. Or, or you... So that painting the darks and looking into the shadow, you start to the tends to, to to see too much detail in the dark. But that doesn't mean there aren't color shifts in the dark. Is that correct? As long as it's dark, as long as the same value. No, it has to be simplified. As you're painting the dark as though. You're looking at the light and you're seeing the shadows peripherally. Otherwise, you see too much detail in the shadow and the shadow becomes important rather than looking shadowy. So that if you, the shadow is really part of your background. So if you put too much detail in the shadow, it belies the fact that it looks shadowy. So is that a flat, transparent color? Well, you make the shadows transparent or rich and warm so they recede. Okay. If you paint the shadows opaque, right. they come forward. Right. Light is opaque and shadow is more transparent. Right. You see. So it's warm shadows and cool lights. Right. Because as a, because warm shadows, warm shadows. But like if I had if I had the shadow, the shadow was its own value, you know, it's dark. Shadow, yes. Right. Yes. But am I only using one color to create that shadow? Or it's OK as long as it's the same value that I can put like a different warms in there? Uh, well, the shadow has to have an overall shadow color. OK. And what mo modifies the shadow is reflected light. Right, OK. So if the reflected light is a little cooler, then you would use a little cooler shadow color. Okay. But every, you could say in a painting, everything in shadow, you could paint every shadow one color, okay. regardless of the local color. So with okay. your blue top, the shadow would be the same color as your face or your hair or the scarf. And you would change the local color in the light. And everybody looking at the painting would accept that. Because in reality, as I alluded to before, only artists look at shadow. People in everyday life get their information from the light. So if you painted, regardless of the change of local color, if you painted every shadow the same color, and painted all the lights their local color, people would accept that. It would still be a successful painting. Or 
you can also modify your shadow slightly so that perhaps the shadow of your blouse or hair or whatever is slightly bluer, you know, or just feels differently. Because it's bouncing. Yeah, so you have the option because a good painting supplies maybe five eighths of the information and the viewer supplies the other three eighths, you see. So does, re does reflected light, you use that to create form? Reflected light necessarily? Does it create form? It depends what's reflecting. Okay. So if a warm light is reflecting, it's, it's warm. If a cool light is reflecting, it's... Oh, the reflected light is the color of the reflected light. But the important thing about reflected light is to use it in a particularly, to use the reflected light in a particular way so that uh, rather than just copying what you see, okay. so that if you wanted to make a softer transition between the light and shadow, you would use reflected light to raise the value of the shadow so that the transition between, it's not dark, light, dark, light, right. it'd be dark, I mean light, reflected light, light, reflected light, light, shadow, you see. So to make the light flow or the view is... So like if you had light on the, on down here and you, you don't necessarily want to bring attention to it, but it is in the light, then you could use reflected light to well, transition. Well, for example, if you wanted stronger, uh, more attention to the eyes, mm -hmm. so you would keep the shadow up here, light and shadow, but if you wanted less attention to that, so you could bring the reflected light under the neck okay. and chin yeah. lighter, so it's not as dramatic light and okay. dark, as it's a, pushing you back up. So, yeah, yeah. so okay. the, the idea, as I said, is to use what you're seeing right. to create right. the look of the painting and the, putting the attention where you want, softening it, making it more dramatic. So th this, is, this is when you're saying then you, you have to be clear about what your intention is, what your concept is of the painting. And yes. then you make those decisions, not necessarily on what's exactly there, but what you think will make a better painting. Yes. Well, of course, mm -hmm. recently I heard uh, someone who made the statement that basically in representational painting, what the painters are doing with representational painting is copying what they're seeing, that all representational painting is a copy of what the artist is seeing. So what I'm saying is it's, 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 vast, yeah, right. it's vastly different. Right, exactly. It just betrays a, a, a very limited understanding of what goes into making right. a good representational. Right. Well, I think it's hard to make that leap. Yes, but even if, let's say, the artist or the painter, depending on their skill, is trying to copy that, it doesn't. Okay. All right. There are a couple of questions. Uh, the first one was whether or not this film was originally two different programs, and it wasn't. Uh, he did it all in, in one morning. And our thinking about playing this again and giving the, uh, you the opportunity to ask questions is that, you know, sometimes things happen so quickly, you know, during a demo that you don't have time to really uh, know what it is you want to ask. And so this was a, a way of giving you guys the opportunity to delve a little more deeply into what David is teaching. So that's why we're not putting a time limit on it and we'll just go, you know, basically, you know, and then 
till the end of the program and then continue it the next week and then start a new program when that's over. So it, it just gives you an opportunity to see it more slowly and have more thoughtful questions, you know, uh, about what it is you're seeing and what, you know, David is doing. Um, we also have a question asking to explain what he's saying about shadow and mainly about the color in the shadow. So uh, it, it, there were a couple things that he was talking about. So he was saying that you can have the same, use the same shadow color in the entire painting. So even if she has like a blue dress, I mean, blue top like she does or the scarf, that the way that shadow works is that it has enough uh, warmth so that it has depth and it will go back, but it doesn't have to have the color, the local color of the object. And so this is a, a, an important thing for you to realize is that shadows have a certain property and what you're painting is the property of the quality of what you're seeing. So the quality or properties of shadow that actually make shadow go back visually on the canvas. So it's, it's because in part what we're doing when we're painting is we're in a sense picking symbols uh, I mean, in a, in a sense, we're seeing reality symbolically in terms of, you know, what does all shadow do and how does shadow go back? Uh, and what is the quality or uh, the properties of light and, and how it comes forward? And of course, David's going to be putting the light on soon. So you'll see that by setting up the darks, <clears throat> he's going to be able to make the light really, uh, really have presence. So the, the color in the shadow is basically that it has to have enough warmth compared to the light uh, that it appears warm and transparent and goes back. So it doesn't have to literally be transparent, but it has the quality of transparency and the quality of uh, enough warmth that it goes back. So, okay, you could resume. Take into account the painter's psychology so right. that five painters painting your portrait or anybody else's portrait or figure, whatever landscape, their psychology, what they choose to put in, how strong, how dark they make the shadow, how strong they make, each thing depend, is really dependent on that particular person's conditioning, right. upbringing, mental state, so that uh, as a five painters painting your portrait will come up with something totally different, right. what they would emphasize, right. what they would play down. Right. So that looking at anybody's painting, as I've said many times, is really a portrait of the painter. Right. It tells what they're thinking, kind of person they are, when you really go into it. Um, so just saying that representational painters are just copying, it's really such a, uh, for want of a better word, a shallow analysis. Sure, sure. He, he should be looking at the camera. Well, he's talking to you. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> people don't want to look at me. They want to look at you. They want to look at you. Well, well it's hard it's because I'm not. I know. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, it's great conversation. Yeah, no, no. I think it's enjoyable. I think it's really it's yeah, important. Yeah, it's a, an important conversation. Yes. I think we all kind of uh, have those same questions. Yes. So, it, yeah, it is important to understand and what in a sense representational painters are in a sense up against with all the, the so-called modern art right. uh, where the writers or curators, critics can say anything they want and it sounds 
wonderful, but it's just words that don't mean anything. Uh, whereas representational painting, so much is involved. <clears throat> you know, the skill, the knowledge, the understanding of what the painter is, is, is trying to do subconsciously or subconsciously or uh, consciously, it's really, actually, <clears throat> I just got a thing from a, uh, the Wiseman Museum where I had a uh, retrospective and of some wo wo woman who's having a show, abstract, <clears throat> and what the curator, Michael, Seiki had wrote about her work, of course, that's part of his job, is it's amazing. And then looking at the, the, the work, which takes so little skill and understanding, it, it, it really boggles, boggles the mind. You know, what you can say about nothing. <laughs> You can say anything about nothing and make it sound like you're right. yeah. really saying something important, something yeah. elevating. Uh, you know, so it, I said it was quite a. Yeah. So, anyhow, what you're trying to do essentially, or what I'm trying to do, is put down brush strokes, marks, let, little marks, let's say, to keep it more abstract and make them as descriptive and as meaningful as possible. So it's not just painting what I see the shadow under the nose, but trying to get this cast shadow to give the shape of the muzzle or that this is back there, this is coming forward. So all that takes uh, a great deal of understanding and discernment uh, so that the better paint, paintings that are better are better be, because the marks, <clears throat> the marks that the artist put down were more relevant, more meaningful than, than not. Uh, like a writer using words that are more descriptive, more appropriate, then they, they might have, the, a lesser writer might have the same, a word that kind of conveys yes. what they're trying, you know, something, but it doesn't have the imperative quality that a better writer has. Yeah, yeah, John, can you stop the video? I think we have a visitor. I can hear Shelly, I can't quite hear what she's saying. Sound you. There you are. Oh my God. It's David. Yeah, John, can you stop the video? Could you make sound loud? Oh, so Melissa, you need to mute your Facebook thing. It's on a delay. There you <laughs> yeah, you, you can't you can't have any audio from the Facebook. Hello? Can you hear me? Wait. Say it again, Sherry. Okay, you can't take the audio off for Facebook. Off your phone. Off oh. your phone. Yeah. Mute it. Sure. Yeah, the only audio you want is Zoom. From your laptop. Is that better? I'm still hearing. You're still on your phone. Is still, you the voice is still not muted on your phone. Yeah, the voice you is still not muted on your, on your phone. phone. Is that better? Turn off the phone. Turn off the phone. Okay. You got it. Okay, David. David's here. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't hear them. I can't hear you.
You can't hear? Huh. Are you, can you hear us? I, yeah, we can hear you guys. Let me, let me zoom in with a different device. We were trying to... Well, now I hear you. So I think, I think if you just- Hang on, I'm gonna, we're gonna zoom in here. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody watching, you know, uh, David thought he might sneak in on this, uh, on this program this morning and he did uh, with the help of uh, his lovely daughter, Melissa. So, so you're gonna get David weighing in on all this, which is great. <laughs> okay. 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 And can you get him on? Hey, Melissa. Hold on. I've got some. That's because I got to turn this off. Yes. Yeah. Let me get rid of this. Okay, all right. Well, just know David's lurking in the background. Um, we can, we could, uh, you wanna start the video and, and then when they tune in, we'll, we'll get them. Yeah, maybe she'll get that. Use a word that really nails something like a Shakespeare where the word and the meaning are so wonderful they, they come together in such a meaningful way <clears throat> that the word and what the word is trying to convey let's say is so much more apt appropriate and meaningful that lends much more weight to what's being written. So you can see how you can get into the painting very, very quickly. Right. Okay, John, John, you could pause again. I think maybe they figured it out. <laughs> so apologize for, uh, for this. We, we didn't know if this would really happen or not, so. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. Okay, dad's gonna put earbuds in and so then I won't be able to hear anything. Oh, you're not going to? Okay, okay. Okay, David, you're here. Sherry, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Hello, Jackie. Hi. So nice to see you. Yes. <laughs> it was interesting to watch the program. Yeah. Well, so um, so we'll, we can run it, and then when there are questions, I'll have uh, I'll have John pause the video, and then uh, and you can answer the questions. Does it sound good? Well, I, I liked your answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll we'll give you a chance to answer too. <laughs> okay. Well, are people hearing this dialogue? Yes. 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 Yeah, you're on yeah. screen. Okay, well, I just wanted to add to what you said, you know, and what I was saying, right what here. I was saying about uh, regarding the person who said that representational painters are just copying. And what represent, representational painters no matter what their skill or ability are doing, in essence, is decoding reality and translating what they see into pieces of paint or brush strokes, et cetera. So what you were saying, Sherry, according to their psychology, ability, visual understanding, how well they decode reality and understand the process of making pieces of paint stand for what they see, which is the same as translating French into English or Italian into Greek, is reassembling what they see visually into the language that we call painting. 
So uh, as you were saying with shadows, shadows, we want sh shadows to have depth and not be noticed and regarding the color of them, et cetera, is a way of decoding what the painter is seeing and then reassembling that code, you know, that shadows have depth and lights have opacity, which means they're cool, et cetera. So that's really in essence, it, and it has nothing, I mean, saying that copying is just a very loose word denoting a lack of understanding on the person's part when they say they're copying reality because as you pointed out each painter's psychology what's important for them to put down the contrast the color the value the edges uh you know that that all comes into play in why one person's portrait looks different than another person's portrait or still life, et cetera. Uh, the more understanding you have, the more clarity of vision, clarity of understanding, that is what makes the difference between just, uh, a, let's say a mediocre painting and a fine painting. She wants so, to say goodbye. She wants to say goodbye to you. Oh, okay. So anyhow, that, that's one thing I just wanted to say. <clears throat> I also wanted to say to Martha Keller, uh, my deep thanks, it was very touching that you noticed the black horn just in terms of perception, but it's all obviously been taken care of and there was nothing uh, untoward about it. So thank you, Martha, that, as I said, very, 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 very perceptive of you to notice and to be concerned. I also want to thank Paul, Messerschmitt, Paul and Julie, for uh, Paul being a fountain of knowledge and uh, coming up with the name of the theater critic of the New York Times that I was speaking oh, about yeah. last week, Walter yeah. Kerr, and his wife, Jean, who was a very successful playwright, but Walter uh, couldn't, couldn't quite get anything he wrote uh, to get off the ground. And a friend of mine pointed out this week, which kind of drove the point home, is if you're having trouble with a painting, you don't ask a critic for help, you ask, would ask another painter. So I think that in a nutshell uh, tells about uh, critics' criticism uh, uh, regarding theater, painting, you know, writing, the arts, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, this is an Academy Award speech. <laughs> I'd like to thank. Oh. <laughs> okay, these are all comments from last week. Uh, I also want to ask Ryan, who mentioned needing the opposite to understand, right? Uh, kind of implying that we need chaos to understand order <laughs> or good to understand evil. And I, I wanted to say to Ryan, you know, I question that, uh, that if you leave, you know what order is, which is a very natural state. We don't need chaos to tell us to be or to not go there, but to be orderly or evil, good. Uh, which, as I said, evil is an aberrated state. And I, as I said, Ryan, I'm questioning whether you need the opposite to understand what good is, or order, et cetera, et cetera. So anyhow, that's uh, something to give some thought. I've always thought about that, actually. Yeah. I mean, evil has nothing to do with good, or bad has nothing to do with But in purpose. my head, it, it kind of does, too. Like, I get where he's coming from. But I, yeah. I know what you're saying, yeah. But in actuality, it's, it's a ver almost a verbal invention. 
I mean, if you're a good person, you have to also understand evil to feel. No, but I think it's for other people to understand if you're good or evil, they need something to compare it to compare from, from an outside yeah. perspective. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, you're the boss man. <laughs> no, 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 as I said, it's something to, to think about. Uh, but, and then some really thought provoking things from Osvaldo. Uh, it, one was one comment from Osvaldo was why paint the way I paint or Sherry or any representational painting, painter paints, it's all been done before. And that in a sense shows a, a kind of thought process that is verbally, when I was starting out, one of the comments aside from when am I gonna get my own style instead of being a Frank Mason student, student, one of the comments always was, this is, this is the 20th century. Why are you painting paint? You know, it's all been done before, just what Asfaldo mentioned. And I would say it's never been done before. When you paint your painting, only you in the moment can make that brush stroke, mix that color, etc. So what you're doing in the moment is totally fresh and new, but the statement it's all been done before is kind of thinking of painting as a product, an item, think of our friend George Carlson and saying that it's, of course, you could say paintings, John Singer Sargent was painting portraits. It's all, it was all done before by Velasquez or Rembrandt or even before Michelangelo and Da Vinci. So to say it's all been done before, as I said, is not actually addressing what takes place in the moment when one is actually painting. Uh, as I said, it's more seeing it as a pr product. The end result of the painting, not the immediacy of understanding that's involved with producing something on canvas. So, uh, and then modern, yeah. Mo what does it mean, modern? So. Uh, what has changed over the centuries? You know, we have more, <laughs> we have more technology, cell phones, this computer, my daughter's sweet daughter's computer, you know, landing a, a spaceship on Mars, you know, high speed rail travel, jet planes, automobiles. In terms of human relationships, we have progressed so little over the centuries. We still have wars and conflicts and hunger, famine. Uh, in fact, with the advent of technology through the ages is to present time, also I have to throw in cyber warfare, human relationships and human psychology hasn't advanced basically one iota. So what is modern? Why does one have to paint something differently today than one painted in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, et cetera, century because art, is a human endeavor and has nothing to do with technology. Uh, one technology has to do with acquisition and art has 
nothing to do with acquisition. I mean, of, obviously there are painters, writers, you know, sculptors, uh, musicians who work to get ahead, to be famous, etc. in any profession. But the purity of it, of just learning hasn't changed despite whatever century we ascribe it to. So pa pa <clears throat> painting today is just as valid as a Beethoven string quartet is valid or Shakespeare is valid. So, so modern uh, really is a verbalization uh, that we're living in the 21st century. Is this the 21st century? Yeah. Uh, or the, et cetera. So that, that is not to confuse materialism with art, uh, Osvaldo or, or anyone. So when you're painting and really in touch and trying to understand another point, uh, which might be very interesting for people to try to understand. Another thing that's often considered is with painters at any stages, they wanna be better for whatever reason, whether it's for material, materialist, and usually for materialistic reasons, I should say. And what Sherry and I were discussing earlier this week before I left was we wanted to not paint uh, so much as to get better, but to try to understand what painting was. So rather than, as I said, in a materialistic sense, I want to get better so I can win prizes or be famous or make money, have a name, et cetera. Uh, I mean, there was some, of course, some of that you want, want to make, make a living, continue what you're doing uh, and entering shows and winning prizes, making some money. But essentially the main thrust of it was let's say, I want to understand what painting means, what solving problems or understanding the whole process of painting. So it was the purpose was to really uh, have more understanding, not just to be able to make pictures, but to understand the, the process itself, the feeling of it, uh, as I've mentioned, have mentioned, put the feeling of putting paint down, uh, watching what happens with this, this kind of an edge, this color next to that color, so that you're always on the edge of the unknown and, and trying to understand painting as a specific discipline, just like a writer putting this word down instead of that word or this combination of words to express more fully what they're thinking. And, and that that's never, never changes. Uh, so <laughs> yes, go ahead. Well, it, we're hearing a lot of background conversation. Is there any way you guys could be someplace where there aren't a lot of people yeah. talking? We could move. Yeah, yeah, and there's a meeting that's about to get out, so it'll probably be like a ton oh, of people, yeah. but. Okay, go back to Joanne. No, over here. Go, oh, go, go back, back to, to Joanne. Joanne. And okay. then we'll come back okay. in. Okay, so, John, can you resume the, the demonstration? Okay, okay, so let's go, so, you wanna go in? And then the whole gesture of the scarf and this coming 
the, the shadow at the bottom kind of rounding and holding, holding the light as it comes. So I just see the light starting to come, and yet this comes around, and this under plane is stopping, stopping this mm -hmm. light here and holding it. So you see what you're putting down is what you're perceiving and how you're you're perceiving it. So seeing that this is not just as under plane, but, but that is. It holds this light coming down, washing. So it's more than just an underplay. And it's part of this whole gesture. So the, the more you can understand what you're seeing, you, can, you put it down with a little more meaning. So as I, I think I did a previous broadcast, uh, the difference between observation and understanding. So you can observe something fairly accurately, but if you understand what you're seeing it, to the point where it has more meaning to you, you put it down differently, where it's not just observation, but it has a larger sense to it. So that this is this essentially. This looks a little too for now. I like to keep it everything open so it doesn't look clotted. So the paint, what I would hard to explain what I mean but a sort of a clotted look, you know, and so this makes a nice design uh, where the, the head and then the transition to the neck and then this slide downward. So you can see this, as I this just getting ahead of myself, I didn't want to, but just to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, so after this stage, the, 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 I mean, I could leave this as background or and put in the light a little, get some feeling of the light. Or I could put in another, go and put in a little, so even though you're working this, you're always looking, you want to be looking from side, side to side. So the simpler you can keep the background, the stronger the light will be. <clears throat> Any, Sherry? Uh huh. Any questions? Uh, no, I mean people are loving it. They're just drinking it all in. <laughs> Uh, Any I mean, a, a few questions, but just about what you're painting on and what, oh. what brushes you're using. I, I'm answering well, all those I'm questions. Using, yeah, uh, what am I? I'm using a treacle. Yeah, filters. Is number, it a number eight? Is it? Number five. Oh, five. Okay. So I can put a little bit of more color in the shadow. just to differentiate it from the hair. And, and you're basically using raw umber and phthalo blue? I'm using and, raw umber and phthalo, yes. And now just a little bit of cadmium, cadmium color. 
Is that is that yellow deep? That's not orange. What? Is that yellow deep? Yellow deep. Yellow deep. Or yellow. Kevin yellow deep. And or, or yellow water. I'm not quite sure what it is. But or what? A yellow orange. Oh, I it looks like cadmium yellow deep. Well, it could be cadmium. Depends on whose it is, I guess. And cad, cad red, you put a little cad red. And a little right? cad, cad red light. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm thinking, should I uh, paint the background or just leave this since we're Okay, actually, now we've got a couple of questions. We want to see background. What? We like to see how you do background. Well, it's always interesting. Background is nothing. No, I know, but it's always good to see. Well, all I would do. Yeah, but there might be a shift in value, right? Would there be a shift in value? Or you well, just... the value is <clears throat> the value of the background. It... The value of the background depends on how strong I took some. I'm going to try uh, Venetian red instead of cadmium red. Yeah. So the value that you make your background, just like I was talking about reflected light, how dramatic right. you want the light to be. Right. So everybody's always interested in how you do backgrounds. It's not how you do it. But you know what I mean. It's it's <laughs> not how you do it. It's the relationship. It's the bad. It's the the stronger you want the light to be, the closer you would paint the shadow, the hair, and the background, keeping these values as okay. close as possible, okay. or as close as not as as close as you want them to be to make the light that dramatic. Okay. So it's really, again, like as I was saying with the reflected light, it's a question of your artistic choice for that particular painting. The softer or the less dramatic you want the light to be. Then well, you how dramatic make... do you want it today? Yeah. So you want it really dramatic today? Because I'm a dramatic person. So, it, like, I'm just saying. It, it has nothing to do with you as a person. It has to do with <laughs> my feeling of what I want to put down. You see? Uh, oh, each It doesn't make the person look more dramatic. It makes the painting have a certain look to it that, that you as the artist wants to... So what would you choose today? To achieve so, and so that's what's really at stake is it's how you feel how you feel that particular day. Now, I mean, I could put some light on just to see. Okay. The role. but at the same time. Considering the time element, I, I would leave the background just okay. time-wise. Okay. Okay? Okay. You agree with that? I agree with anything you say, if you can't fit everything in. Yeah. But you're, okay. But what? I, no, I understand what you're saying. It's all about how much, how, 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 how much you want the light to, um. Yeah, that's what's important. Okay. Okay. For, and that will vary from painting to painting, you know, so it really has to do with your choice. So if you wanted, if you wanted the light to be really pronounced. Then you would keep the value of the shadow, the hair, and close. the background itself close. as close okay. in value. And when would you want the light not to be so pronounced like you know obviously you want light and shadow but say you have a portrait and you say oh it doesn't need to be quite so strong what what circumstance would that be do you it's think? your feeling okay for that particular painting okay what you want that particular painting okay. to to have you know and of course as i said 
you're in this painting, you're starting and the uh, time element and everything. It's kind of, and a demonstration at the same time right. is very different, uh, you know, because you, it's yeah. like cut to the chase yes. as quickly. Okay. I mean, but so I could just not, nah, I hate to. No, don't, don't okay. do it. Are you going to do a little bit of light? Yeah. Okay, so that's I'm, more important. That's more that, important. That's you I'm, explained, you did explain it very well as far as what you would do for the background. Yeah. So I don't think yeah. that's necessary. Yeah, I don't, I try not to be dogmatic yeah. about it. But yeah. uh, also some of the things thinking about, like when I'm putting this, like for every form, there has to be a hard edge, right. a soft edge, a hard edge. So, so that's why I put this in early on to know where my hard edge, okay. which gives me the direction that the light is. But also, as I said, what's important here is to know that this leading edge of the shadow you, you're always trying to make the, a flat surface look to, so this leading edge out here has to be look stronger that this is out in front and this goes back in space so okay. that's as a trying to understand what you're seeing and making the most appropriate marks or as a the analogy I said with a writer the best word to describe this is forward and this is just that much further yep. back in space. Yeah. So it's so it might not look that way to you in terms of observation just observing but being conscious of that gives your painting just that much more more depth, more understanding than someone who just sees this as one shadow. So it might be just minimally. Now, you, what I could do, with, you know, if I took a little uh, opaque umber or whatever and just made that lighter or made a piece of the hair out here in light just a little stronger but just what's important is just to be conscious of the fact that all the marks you're putting down are tr you're trying to make which was the essential problem as i've stated in the past of painting to make a flat surface look dimensional. So when every mark you're making, you're trying to convey convey that, which is part of not only your skill, but your understanding. You see. So I'll I'll just do a little bit of light yeah, on right. in terms of the time we have left. So any other questions? Yes. People are wanting you to stop talking. <laughs> Joanne. What? People are saying let him paint. Oh. Stop talking. Stop talking. All right, I stop talking. Uh, let's see. And somebody was concerned that they would love to see you paint the mouth. I, I told them you usually paint, paint that mouth. last. Yeah. Legs. Well, okay, so Mahala, Mahala is saying, do you uh, make brush strokes? Uh, he said, uh, up and down, sideways, do you ever make down, up, from down to an upward movement to achieve a certain direction of brush stroke? I well, guess you just... have two basic brush strokes, and you either painting form or direction. So this this way, painting this way would be direction, painting across 
the form is form. So this this would be direction, and this would be form. So those are your two basic brush strokes uh, that you're trying. What that what you're trying to describe is either form or direction. And, and then there are just brush strokes that you feel are above and beyond form, which is hard to kind of describe. Just that you feel something goes in a particular manner. Oh, and then Beth said that maybe you could come back later for an interview. <laughs> who, who said that? <laughs> Joanne. What? So Beth is saying that maybe Joanne could come back later for an interview. For what? <laughs> oh, you mean shut up. <laughs> shut up now. <laughs> come back two weeks from today. <laughs> Nobody will be here. <laughs> I get it. And by the way, just while everybody's watching, we, we are going to take a little hiatus next week, but then we'll re, uh, resume the next week. Yes, we're going so, to Oklahoma. For an art show, so. So the difference between paintings of the 1600s, 1700, up until the 19th century, the, the people basically, the painters basically painted, people basically painted form. And so the early paintings, let's say the Dutch painters, all, all the painters of that period painted form and the preponderance of their brush strokes went across and then came John Singer Sargent and the 19th century painters and they wanted to be bravura so they painted this way you can only make relatively short brush strokes but this way you can make long brush strokes. So instead of form, they painted directions, direction, which gave them the, that zippity doo da feeling of virtuosity. And that people tend to, like Sargent or Zorn, <clears throat> Baldini, Celia Bow, they, their people tend to look more, or less solid, I should say, less solid and not quite grounded because of the wanting to make or to be known as virtuosic painters. So here it's like putting down light and color and paint. So you have paint to paint with. And then you see here it drifts off. So you, I would ease off on the brush, you see, to let this kind of get into the shadow. And so the idea is to put down paint that looks looks good, and have paint to paint with, and get this thrust forward. Did you say somebody wanted to see me paint the mouth? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Why? Why is 
Is the math so difficult? Um, the thing, you know, and then if something gets softer or eases, you just ease off on the brush. You know, okay, John, you can so stop. You could stop the video. <laughs> well, thank you guys for hanging in there for this. Uh, we uh, we're excited that David did pop in, and it looks like now that they've done it once, that next time they'll have a better idea of how to jump in. So I think they said that they have signed off and said goodbye. Anyway, we're glad that you guys tuned in. I think this is a good place to pause, and we will. And hi, Jackie, and we will uh, continue this video next week. And uh, uh, and if you guys think of questions between now and then, you know that'll be great. Tune in. Jackie's going to be here again to uh, to help us and uh, to to feed the questions to us. Anyway, I hope you like our idea. <laughs> I know it didn't go totally smoothly, but but pretty well. And, uh, and uh, we're, we're happy that you guys tuned in and uh, we will cer certainly read all your comments. So if you have questions that, uh, that you want to put in, you know, to this video now, you, you can do that and we'll get it for next week. But anyway, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, again, uh, check out our figure workshop because I, I think you're going to really love it. Um, and it's from the 24th to the 27th of June. Anyway, just go to brightlightfineart.com and you can get all the information. So, and thank you, John, behind the scenes for, uh, for running everything. It, it was like a vacation for me too. So anyway, and it was thrilling for me to see David. That was the first time since he left. So that was really light, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys for tuning in and we will see you next week for uh, Sundays with David LaFell, The Painting Doctor. <laughs>